Welcome to this meeting of the Geographical Sciences Committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I'm Pat McDowell, Chair of the Committee. We're glad to have you with us, whether in real time on Zoom or viewing the recording of this session later. Before we begin, I want to say a few words about our committee. The Geographical Sciences Committee is a standing committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The National Academies are nonprofit organizations with a dual mission to honor the nation's top scientists and to provide objective, independent advice on science, technology, engineering, and medicine. The National Academies were established at the direction of President Lincoln and have been providing these services for over 150 years. The Geographical Sciences Committee provides advice to society and to government at all levels using the methods of spatial analysis and representation. We address the geographic dimensions of human environment interactions, spatial location and concentration, and place-based research and policy at all spatial scales. The committee also fosters international cooperation by serving as a liaison to other national geographical organizations including as the official US liaison to the International Geographical Union. The committee is supported by funding from NSF. These are the current members of the committee. I'd like to pause now and give them an opportunity to unmute and introduce themselves. I'll start. I'm Pat McDowell. I'm a professor emerita at the University of Oregon. Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Root. I'm a professor at The Ohio State University. Dawn. I'm Dawn Wright, Chief Scientist of the Environmental Systems Research Institute, or ESRI, and also courtesy professor of Geography and Oceanography at Oregon State University. Janet. Hi, I'm Janet Franklin. I'm in uh, the Department of uh, Botany and Plant Sciences at University of California, Riverside. Buddha. Let's go on to Ben. Hi everyone, Ben Preston uh, with the RAND Corporation where I'm a senior policy researcher and director of the Community Health and Environmental Policy Program. Janelle, would you unmute and introduce yourself? Yes, I unfortunately am unable to start my video, but I'm Janelle Knox Hayes. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Glenn. Hello, I'm Glenn McDonald. I'm a professor of geography at UCLA. Okay, and Budu? I'm also unable to turn on my video, but um, Budu Bhaduri, I am uh, the research division director for um, geospatial science and human security at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Great. I think I got everybody, thank you all. As geographers, the GSC committee discusses a wide gamut of issues. These are some of the topics we've highlighted in our meetings. Most recently, we discussed COVID-19 and the geography of vulnerability at our fall meeting. You can find the presentations and recordings from the meeting on the committee's website. Today, our topic is disaster response during a pandemic. Our program today will consist of three sessions. The first is our panel of decision makers, who I will introduce in a moment. The committee has prepared a few questions for them, which they will discuss, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Please, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Then we'll take a short break and return to hear from two researchers who work at the intersection of disaster response and geography. Then in our third session, we'll have time for Q&A with all panelists from both sessions. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and understand that any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our recording. A link to the recording, as well as a copy of the slides will be posted on our website within the week. 
So let me now introduce our first panel. Carol Morley has served as the District Director for Public Health, Idaho North Central District for 28 years. Morley reports to the Policymaking Board of Health comprised of county commissioners. She's active locally as well as nationally in public health. She serves on the board of the National Association of Counties where she represents local public health and holds leadership positions on the Public Health and Healthy Counties Subcommittee and the Resilient Counties Subcommittee. She has been active in the National Association of County and City Health Officials, and she served as the president of NACHO 2010 to 2011. She's passionate about public health and shares her passion with numerous public, private, and nonprofit organizations. Heather Reuter is the Assistant Commissioner of Risk Reduction and Recovery at the New York City Emergency Management. Since joining in 2007, Reuter has led the development and execution of various plans and tools related to emergency management, evacuation, and risk reduction. This ongoing effort has given her technical expertise in assessing New York City's risks from hazards and leading the city's coordination for over $250 million in FEMA hazard mitigation grants. Her other initiatives include the Interim Flood Protection Measures Program to deploy temporary flood protection at more than 55 sites and launching the country's first web-based hazard mitigation plan for a local jurisdiction in 2019. She serves, served as the EOC manager for New York City's COVID-19 response and oversaw the New York City Emergency Management COVID-19 hotel program that managed 35,000 reservations to support isolation and quarantine of individuals at risk of exposure. Steve Steinberg is the Geographic Information Officer for Los Angeles County, California. In collaboration with a team of highly skilled GIS professionals, he guides the geospatial strategy for more than 10 million residents and 100,000 county employees across 35 departments. Dr. Steinberg is a self-titled geospatial evangelist. He is passionate about the use of technology to solve real problems of people in their environment. Prior to joining LA County, he served as principal scientist and department head for information management and analysis at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project Authority and as a professor of geospatial science at Humboldt State University, California. He continues teaching as an adjunct professor in the graduate programs at UC Irvine and CSU Long Beach and is actively involved in geospatial professional organizations, currently serving as a member of the board of directors for Eurisa International and the California Geographical Information Association. Chris Vaughn serves as the Geospatial Information Officer for FEMA. In this role, he's led organizational change, established an integrated geospatial workforce across the agency, and is advancing innovative technologies within the emergency management community. Vaughn also serves as the Chief of the Response Geospatial Office within the Planning and Exercise Division. The RGO delivers policy, guidance, and training for the FEMA geospatial enterprise. He's a member of the National Response Coordination Staff, where he serves as a Situational Awareness Section Chief. Since joining FEMA in 2010, Vaughn has provided crisis decision support for more than 250 incidents, including earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, wildfires, tornadoes, and pandemics. For COVID-19, he was appointed as co-lead for the Data and Analytics Task Force. In this role, he supported the delivery of advanced modeling technology and analysis related to pandemic response operations. Today, we're focusing on the problems of responding to disasters during the pandemic. It's a big topic, so we've suggested a few specific aspects for our panelists to address geospatial and other technologies, common spaces and infrastructure, responder preparedness, and other resources. But they may bring in any issues that they think are relevant. Okay, if everybody's ready to go, I'm going to start with the questions now. And I'm gonna ask 
I, I'm going to start with the first question, and I'm going to ask Heather to respond to this, and then I'd like the other panelists to just chime in when they when they're ready to. First question: What was needed for disaster preparedness last year that was different from previous years because of the pandemic? Heather. Hi, thank you. Um, and I apologize, my video won't, I can't turn it on. So um, my voice will do here. Um, oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, what, what do we need for disaster preparedness last year? Um, that was different. Uh, I mean, a multitude of things from last year certainly challenged us um, here in New York City, especially being kind of the epicenter of wave one. Um, in emergency management, for those on the phone that don't maybe know this, we, we tend to work in what's called an emergency operations center setting, which means we all work in one room. So kind of the, the main hub for New York City is we have representatives from everyone in one place. And that's how emergency management works and kind of how our entire structure is designed. And having to very quickly go virtual um, and manage an incident um, in a virtual setting was just very um, new for us. So. Uh, clearly having to, we, I think we were able to successfully do it and we've had times where we've done it in pieces, but cutting the entire city into this remote structure um, and having um, just a completely different way that you really manage an incident instead of walking over and talking to someone, having to set up calls and chats and making sure someone's IT was working. So I know everyone's gone through this, but um, where the information changes so quickly, um, that was certainly quite a lot of, um, you know, a, a big adjustment for us, and that's something that we you know, were really kind of designed to do in practice, um, you know, before COVID. But we've learned quite a lot too. I think also the data management piece and the ge geographic extent of COVID. Um, normally, in our preparedness efforts, we try to really understand the risk of different hazards um, pre-incident. So where, you know, where are the the building types or the neighborhoods or communities or the infrastructure assets that are more at risk from different hazards. A lot of that is our preparedness efforts and we try to plan for that in advance and strategically think through where um, the response need might be. Um, but with COVID, it was citywide. So, you know, we're 305 square miles of, of city here and five, uh, five counties within our city. And um, really the hotspots of where the the needs were and where um, we were seeing the rise of um, you know, whether it was cases or hospital surge, um, we had to be very nimble and being able to deal with a citywide response. And that's not something that we had always planned for. We always kind of felt we would have more isolated impact um, and had a sense of where the geography would be. But um, you know, every you know, every kind of few days to weeks to months, it seemed that we had to re uh, shift. Uh, where where the operations need to center around based on where the the, um, the surge of need and demand were. So um, those were all kind of things that I think we'll take into our preparedness efforts more here in New York City. Great, thank you. This is Carol. Well, I'll, I'll lead off on that. Um, thank you, Heather, for teeing, teeing that up. So I'm in the north central little skinny part of Idaho, snugged right between the state of Washington and Montana. I'm in a five county health district, public health district. We cover 13,500 square miles with only a population of about 120,000. So our um, total diabolic opposite of New York City and um, the structure and the population and the, the geographical outlay of um, being in a, in a rural setting like we are. We're also in, my five counties are in two time zones. We are um, divided by mountain ranges and rivers. And so finding people sometimes it was more of a, an issue than um, having too many um, um, resources, lack of resources going forward. We also last year, that was totally different is we had major fires that were going on in the Northwest. In our state of Idaho, um, and the state of Washington, Montana, all of that. So not only were we gearing up and dealing with a pandemic and illness related to pandemic, but we were also dealing with the fires and the smoke and the, um, the changes that needed to happen in partners, as well as the way we have typically 
addressed or responded to disasters in the past. We, we know how to work with our tribes. It's also in our five counties. We work really closely with our national forests. We do smoke control. We do education training. Um, smoke is something that we do all of the time. But we weren't re really geared up and ready to deal with the firefighters with their smoke issues and having COVID at the same time. So um, it was an, a new adventure for us in managing how COVID collided with the fires and the smoke issues in our five counties and having enough response ability, ability to respond um, to doing both of those issues. We've always worked with our, our smoke jumpers, um, always you know, help them with their kitchens and their camps and, and their health issues. But this was different when we needed to evacuate a whole group of smoke jumpers because of a COVID exposure um, and where the, the nearest hotel was to put them up for their you know, 10 to 14 day isolation period, taking them out of the, the smoke, um, the fire response also was a major change for us in what we've done differently last year versus other responses we've done in the, in the past. Well, hey, I'll jump in next and sort of fall between Heather and Carol. Uh, so LA County is, as probably many of you know, uh, the largest by population in the country, uh, larger than 40 or so states. Uh, so only 4,000 square miles, so not quite as dispersed as Carol's uh, and not quite as dense as New York City, although the population's in the same ballpark. Um, so I think we had a few items I'll piggyback on. Um, Heather talked about the EOC and how do you deal with bringing people together in an emergency context with a pandemic going on? Um, one of the things we struggled with early on as a county is our EOC didn't have a clue what to do with the pandemic. So they had everyone come to the EOC and they were sitting next to each other and they were close, you know, they were calling in emergency, uh, you know, disaster response workers under that protocol, just as though it was a fire or a flood or an earthquake. Um, and what that led to was some interesting problems around, you know, how do we socially distance? How do we get enough PPE into the EOC so people can still work effectively? Um, I will say admittedly, um, for the folks in the geospatial side of the house, um, they were called in the same way as everybody else, but we had, I will say, um, lively debates around whether or not that was even necessary because um, I kept suggesting to our EOC folks, the geospatial folks can work just as effectively from home or from wherever they're working remotely um, and, and collaborate and share data and produce all the same mapping and information and so on that they would do if they all come to a physical room that was about maybe 15 by 15 and had five people crammed in it, um, you know, side by side. Uh, so I think for us, it was learning how do we adjust to away from business as usual to something different because this isn't a typical emergency situation. Um, and, you know, eventually it got sorted out. They started letting people work remotely. Um, but even in the context of the EOC working traditionally, the pandemic is such a big issue to deal with. We weren't just dealing with GIS people and, 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 and so on at the OC. We still had to collaborate across our county departments, you know, our, um, our health people, our planning people, and so on. So we were already working in an online, you know, AGOL type environment anyway. Um, and I think what happened over time is we proved to the EOC that that could work. And eventually they released the, at least the geospatial folks from the EOC back to their homes. Um, granted, it took six months into the pandemic till that happened. Um, it was a challenge to convince people this could work. Um, and some of the things Heather alluded to, communications was one of the big concerns. You know, we kept hearing, well, no, we have to be able to walk into the GIS room and talk to the people about the mapping or about the analysis they're doing. Uh, we, we, sh we went to the point of setting up 24 hour WebEx meetings that were just always open so they could walk into the room and talk to the person through the computer instead of walking into the room and talk to the person physically. Um, after they got used to the idea that, you know, modern telecommunications, Zoom meetings work, uh, things got a lot better. Um, and, and I think, you know, that played out really importantly a bit later into the pandemic. Like Carol mentioned, we have fires in LA County. Uh, we had fires break out last summer and I suspect, you know, we will again. 
So dealing with that new emergency in the middle of the pandemic, we were much more prepared. Um, we had built out through the early phases of the pandemic, you know, the web tools, the dashboards, the web mapping applications and so on. So they could be spun up and comfortable for the other emergency managers to work with. Um, so I think that was a big thing. Um, one other thing I wanna to touch on, which I think Carol alluded to a little bit with the firefighters, we're much more densely populated. So when we have fires, we have to evacuate neighborhoods. We have lots of people that are in a fire zone and need to move out of their homes. And for us, that was another challenge. How do we think about evacuation zones and planning and where to put whole communities? You can't just send everybody to the local school gym in the middle of a pandemic. That created all kinds of challenges as well. So thinking about how we shift evacuation planning in the middle of a pandemic because there's a fire or some other emergency um, also was something uh, we had to had to pivot to very quickly because that hadn't been thought of before. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, y'all. I'll, I'll round it out, I guess. So, um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I was listening to the other panelists and, and it's bringing it's stirring up a lot of memories for me. And all I can think about is the good, bad and the ugly. Um, I'm right there with Steve. Uh, we, we activated everybody. We brought everybody in, <laughs> you know, right in the middle of the pandemic, everybody come on in. And, um, and it was, that was, that was not the right thing to do. And I think it took us, you know, probably two to three, four months to kind of figure out this thing called teams or zoom or whatever platform we were on. We were on all of them. Um, and it eventually, like everybody else on the call, we eventually got through that and figured that out. And, and, and there was a lot of trust really, I think is, is the word I'm looking for that, you know, I can trust you to do your job and you're going to be able to do that. I think the benefit of, of that trust factor really uh, brought in a bit of equality uh, because we, we at the emergency management level, we operate at a, at a very inverted pyramid level. ICS is an inverted pyramid where all things start at the authority having jurisdiction at the, at the local level. But because we were on a common platform, that that being in our in our homes, in our you know our spare bedrooms, uh, it, it brought a level of equality that we 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 kind of broke apart from that local county state fed arbitrary siloed perspective, and it, it got us all talking to each other just like this, uh, and it kind of broke apart those those artificial barriers that have been up for for decades. Um, that's some of the good that came out of it. Going back a little bit to the bad and the ugly, is you know, we haven't had a pandemic since 1917, 18. And so nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew how to move data. I mean, we've already really had, you know, Zika and, and, you know, swine flu and those kinds of things, but nowhere near this scale. So my scale um, was all 50 states and all of our territories. You know, in fact, we were dealing with the international community where we were getting and receiving uh, products and services from the world. So it was a worldwide thing. We had to mic up all 50 states. Um, Dawn's on, so I'll pick on Esri in a good way. I mean, we used ArcGIS online. Uh, we had uh, weekly calls, and it felt like we were advancing as a community every week by six months. Every week, we moved the needle six months forward. Um, and, and eventually, we got to the point where uh, the, the bad and ugly, again, is, is we were really struggling with getting data about the pandemic, and, and there was an unprecedented demand signal to no impacts at the individual hospital level every day. And, you know, trying to, to tell some, you know, I can barely tell you where the hospital is geographically, let alone bed counts and hospital sheets and what kind of, uh, you know, sailing solution they're using today. I'm, I'm talking too much. I want to get off my soapbox, but we finally got through that, but it was painful. It, we literally devolved into an Excel spreadsheet pandemonium. That's how information moved was through Excel spreadsheets. Um, I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, all the after actions coming out of this because it's going to make us better prepared for the healthcare system and the sector of how information is going to flow for the next one. Thanks. Thank you all for those comments. Um, now we're going to open it up to questions from the panelists and discussion from the, from the Geographical Sciences Committee and discussion among uh, the panelists. Um, I'll start it off. Um, there's two interesting themes that I heard most of you highlight, and that is 
information technology, but the other one was human communication and the challenges you had in human communication, but also the learning from human communication. And I guess a question might be, do we have a new procedure now? Do we have a new standard or new ways or do we need more tools to improve that interpersonal communication and the flow of information? I'll try and take a stab at that. <laughs> um, I would say partially we do. Um, as I alluded to, it took us some time to pivot to using these online tools. Um, you know, I think like Chris said, um, during the early days, I literally had, you know, WebEx, GoToMeeting, Zoom, Teams, my cell phone, text messages, Slack, you know, literally I had, I had, I have, I had six screens in front of me, two cell phones, and every application open all the time because different departments or organizations or entities we collaborate with all had a preferred platform and there was no coordination between those, which made it chaotic at best. Um, but I think as we've matured in this process, you know, like many, we've settled on some standard technologies that we're using and that's really helped, um, you know, because now, everyone's on the same platform, at least within the county family, all our departments and our EOC. Um, but that was that was a struggle because nobody knew what what the best way to communicate was. Um, and, and it took us some time. I think where I say we're only partially there is because we're still in emergency mode. We haven't de, you know, we haven't demobilized yet. So we haven't done the hot wash to really understand the pros and cons of all the things we've done. It's been very on the fly. Um, and I think that will come and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to compare notes with other organizations and agencies um, to get some of these best practices worked out and documented. Um, and I think that's really the next step we need. Um, Thank you, yeah, Steve. I mean, to piggyback, um, you know, it's nothing like an emergency to really kind of trial run and test run everything um, and have and reduce all those barriers. So. Um, you know, things I think would have taken years to get to, we got to, we really had no choice, we had to do it in days or weeks and do the figure out all these remote capabilities. Um, I think we in New York have gotten only, you know, better and better in routinizing the things that have been best practices. Um, we've done a couple mini hot washes, um, a lot of it going to what some of the other speakers uh, discussed was these um, combined events or when you have the pandemic and for us a heat wave or coastal storm or winter weather. And so how do we, you know, manage multiple disasters and do it remotely? I think, um, you know, some of the best practices is I, I think the more remote capabilities we have, it's actually defined a lot of efficiencies in certain things too. Um, for, again, for those that don't work in emergency management, uh, situation reports are the big thing you cut out at the end of your operational period and that's your, kind of narrative, it, it's your report um, that goes up to your leadership about everything happening in the different sectors. Um, and what I feel like we spent kind of years fine tuning in Word, now we have these really amazing dashboards that are automated in real time and everyone can go and collaborate in real time and make the edits. And so I think there's just been so much information and so much um, use cases that come out of this year um, that I think we're going to have so much to work from in terms of the improvement of how you visualize and, and say what's going on. People's consumption of information is so different. You know, it's just, that's just happening in the world now. So reading a tweet is more interesting than a book. And so in emergency management, we, we have to think about how do you tell the story of what's happening in the disaster um, in kind of short form and how people want to digest it. And there's a lot more visual to it than I think traditionally these long um, word heavy uh, documents that we were using. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> I want to remind the attendees that you can put questions into the Q&A box. Carol, um, you already had a situation where you're kind of dispersed and remote. Does that right. mean that your, your group was better equipped to deal with this new way of communicating than no, I, perhaps the cities? I think we had um, equal or more challenges, um, at least equal challenges like everyone did we actually, um, because we are so remote and our um, infrastructure is, is quite weak, 
when it comes to bandwidth and cell phone service and a lot of that um, the technology that um, is afforded by some others that are in a more you know bigger area we communication was still an issue we still had many staff working in a building in their offices because there was no connectivity from their homes um, and no connectivity no cell service from our our rural office we have five rural county offices and um, during all of this when everyone was using a lot of bandwidth because of calls and zooms and everything we were not able to um, actually do a lot of the remote telecommuting because of, of some of those um, deficiencies that we have in our infrastructure. So we've been working on that. And so that is improving. And so if anything is coming out of this, it's really brought to fact that we need, we need to gear up for this um, much better, even if it's costing a lot of money for us to actually get um, connectivity out in our, our little areas. But on the human nature of communication, like you talked about, Pat, the other part that we were seeing, because we are, you know, boots on the ground and we had to deal and still are daily. I mean, setting up call centers, even setting up um, that, you know, online presence so people could um, watch a map, could watch dashboards, could watch um, those things that public health was doing. Our state started with this because they have that capacity. They have the geospatial people in-house. Local public health in Idaho doesn't. But it soon became so obvious to our governor and others that because of our geography in Idaho and our politics, we really had different catchment areas. There are seven public health districts in Idaho. We had different areas that needed their own dashboards. We needed our own um, S3 maps. We needed our own you know, data to show our own people. They weren't trusting it from the state. They wanted it from the local. So quickly again, we didn't, we had to gear up. But like others have said, you go from a brain idea to implementation in 14 days, it's like, oh my goodness, I never thought my crew could have could do that. But what an amazing um, abilities when you're challenged like that. But dealing with the public and the communication issues with the public was a real struggle and is better. Um, but not only the communication, but the tone of the communication. I ultimately had to start bringing staff in that were doing hotline um, answering our call center for counseling um, because of the abuse they were getting on the phone line and um, needing to do some of that in person, um, even though we were, you know, in a, at least in the same building together in the same space. Um, but that was that was a different part of the human communication that I had not expected at all. We could we could talk to each other remotely on staff because that trust is there. Our partners we have worked with a lot a lot of the time, but the public communication was really um, in lots of lots of times detrimental to um, the mental health of our employees. So we have to continue to keep that in mind as we look at ways that we communicate. And most of the public, a lot of the public, still wanting it on a phone call. They don't want to chat with you on an email. They want to chew you out with the phone on their ear. Oh, very moving. Thank you for that. Um, Janelle has a question. Janelle Knox Hayes, would you like to unmute? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you to the panelists. A really lively discussion, really interesting to understand what's happened in the last year and how it's changing your emergency response. And I, I have two questions associated to that. One is about the unique compounded risks that we've been experiencing this semester. And does that change, I mean, this, this past year, does that change the way that you think about emergency response and, and how your divisions are organized? I think, Heather, you kind of addressed this a bit by saying everybody had to physically be in the same room because the issues are so um, intertwined and associated. But how do we how do we plan and think about these kinds of events happening more frequently in the future? And then associated with that is to what extent I, I've been doing some work analyzing compound risks in COVID in New York City and was talking with an official who said, you know, there's a high expectation 
that individuals do a lot of the planning in advance of emergency events. So they know they have friends and family on high ground or they know where they're supposed to go. Um, to what extent is that the expectation? And is there any capacity in thinking about the way our technologies are changing to design solutions that better prepare individuals in these kinds of emergency events to be able to assess their options and, and to respond in real time if they don't necessarily know where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. I can take a quick stab at that first. I think the two things I really wanna stress uh, is, is there's actually a lot of, if it's the wrong thing to say, if there's a silver lining to all of this um, is uh, it really did force the conversation, at least in emergency management. I've been doing this since Katrina We've been flying planes since Katrina. Uh, and in fact, during Katrina, we had so many planes flying, they almost flew into each other. And they're all trying to take a picture of the damage. Um, so there's a large industry, both satellite, aerial, UAS, ground-based fo photos that are taken following a disaster. But it wasn't until COVID. It wasn't until COVID that people weren't able to go out physically into the field to collect damage assessments. And it fundamentally changed the conversation, at least within FEMA. Um, we've been screaming to the, sh the rooftops, look, you can use a satellite image, you can use a plane, you can use a UAS, you don't have to go out into the field. But it was really falling on deaf ears because we like going out into the field. We like knocking on doors and we like that in engagement. We sent 17,000 housing inspectors to Hurricane Harvey. We did. Meanwhile, we flew the entire thing 20 times. You know, I've got pictures, but I also have 17,000 housing inspectors on the ground. It really wasn't until COVID. And so to your question directly for last year, we had the most active Atlanta hurricane season on record. The entire Western half of the United States burned up in flames. I mean, it was a terrible fire season last year. Um, you know, uh, we had tornadoes and floods and on top of all that, a pandemic. But what we did have was we had more virtual damage assessments, remote damage assessments than I've ever seen in my career. I've been at FEMA for 11 years. So there's really been this, this huge shift uh, for the use of geospatial technologies. Two more things and I'll get off the soapbox. You know, going back to that communication strategy, right? It, it, it brought everybody on an equal playing field. I could do a Zoom call with my state, local, county, tribal, um, counterpart, I could bring up that image. We could debate that damage assessment in real time, virtually, and we're all on equal playing ground, right? Which is a, that's never happened before. And then I think the third thing, especially as it relates to data information management, GIS really, really knocked it out of the park, I think. Um, when all other systems struggled, and once again, we really did approach the beginning parts of this pandemic from an Excel spreadsheet. That's how we were reporting everything was through Excel spreadsheet. We eventually got to the point where GIS became a system of record where that was the only way to really manage information was through GIS. And then we broke it out that it didn't have to go into a map but it started to go into other dashboards whether it's Tableau, Power BI. It didn't have to go into a map. I think that's when things really started to turn for us is that it was a system of record you could uh, and, 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 and still meet those COVID, you know, stay away restrictions. I want to piggyback on everything Chris just said, because I think we, we experienced the same thing. Um, you know, as I said, we had fires in the middle of the pandemic here in LA County. Um, we've always flown damage assessment imagery, um, after fires, um, but put people out on the ground very frequently. And, that was uh, last last fall, our Bobcat fire was the first time I think we really took a, a, an image first approach to damage assessment. And, and, you know, and if people had to go into the field, it was much more limited. We weren't putting as many people out on the ground. Um, and I think it's taught us an interesting lesson in general, which is, you know, maybe we don't need to put so many people out on the ground anyway, even if there's not a pandemic. So, you know, there's, as you said, the silver lining to the pandemic is we were forced to learn new ways of doing our workflows that we hadn't done before. Um, I think, you know, one of the things we learned too, and it's actually become a statewide initiative in California with our state GIO is we had no clue what to define as evacuation zones when we have events. Um, so it, it turned us to this idea of, 
you know, instead of waiting for a lot of data coming in from the field during a fire as the perimeter is changing or whatever it may be, um, it would be good to actually pre-plan evacuation zones to understand them in context, not just of the risk of the event, but also just the traffic flow, the, you know, the congestion issues and other things. I mean, I, as I understand it, a lot of hurricane zones, they have evacuation routes, they do that, you know, or tsunami evacuation zones. They kind of have predefined routes and how you evacuate people in sequence, but we don't do that as well on fires because we don't know where and when they're gonna happen. So now we're working statewide, all the counties with our state GIO to develop a statewide sort of evacuation zone map um, that can, essentially say, instead of drawing them on the fly when the event happens, we're just going to say, there's an event here, click, you know, toggle this one to evacuate, toggle this one to evacuate. Um, and knowing that that'll be an orderly process. Um, that's going to take us a little time, but we, we've already had several meetings and that's going to continue. Um, and I think, again, it's that idea that there's a lot of things we can pre-plan for, but you know, the traditional emergency response model is often, you only do the work during the emergency because that's when the funding and the resources are available. And then as soon as the emergency ends, there's no resources to do anything and everyone goes back to their regular work. So I think we're trying to, to really look at that a little bit differently and look at ways we can leverage the lessons learned and other sorts of resources so we can do some planning between emergencies. Mm -hmm. Great, really, really interesting comments. I have a couple of questions set up, but I'd just like to briefly call on Carol and get the rural perspective from her on two of the big issues you, you have both raised, which is the role of GIS as kind of the central data collection. Did that work in her area? And also the use of imagery. Carol? So we have, for the fire part of last year, um, GIS was a critical component. and. I could be on calls with our national forest and we did daily briefings and we could all see the same maps and the same images and the fire that's spreading um, as it was turning its way through um, parts of our counties. So absolutely was, was um, of huge value. Now, not managed from my facility, being a small local health department, managed from you know, the forest service, which um, had that, that capacity. When, um, for the, the local public health, as far as the pandemic response, what we're using most of our, our GIS mapping now is to um, help people locate clinics, where, where the vaccine is, how close it is to where they might live, um, those sorts of uses for um, the, the mapping tools that are out there. And it's been very, very beneficial. Um, we have some of that capacity in-house, which is great in a limited amount um, to do our own mappings. And then combining that with the state's abilities and the state's um, larger capacity, that's, that's how we've managed a lot of that GIS work at the local level. Yeah, that's great. That makes sense. Okay, I'm gonna call on Don Wright, who has a question. Don, would you like to unmute? Yes, thank you very much, and, and I very much appreciate the insights and the and the frankness of the panel. I wanted to uh, touch on a point that that Carol raised uh, in terms of infrastructure. Uh, as we know, Congress seems to be going round and round on how to define infrastructure, and maybe that's a false uh, struggle because of the politics involved there. But I wondered, especially given that we are in fact in this near constant state of disaster response, uh, how would the panel uh, define the most important piece of infrastructure uh, for you? Well, Don, data. this is care. Oh, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> I was just gonna say that one word, data. I mean, and we've been talking as a county about that for several, many years, that data is infrastructure. Just like the national highway system enables commerce, data in a, enables analysis and understanding. Um, so I think that's our key thing that we've, you know, I keep pushing in our county is we need that data infrastructure to support all of this stuff, disasters or otherwise. Um, and I think the secondary one, which is also part of what Congress is debating, is the broadband stuff. Um, there's still 
it's it probably more for us in the urbanized areas. There's still an assumption everyone has the internet and you just put something up on the internet and they'll know what to do. They can get a vaccine, they know to evacuate, whatever. We have a massive div digital divide problem in LA County. We have, you know, hundreds of thousands of households with no internet and, you know, million, you know, well over a million people. And they're in some, you know, and it's, it's nothing surprising to those who look at this data, but, um, the assumption that you could just post it and everyone will get it, or you can hit a cell phone, you know, an emergency signal on the cell phones and everyone will get it is, is farcical at best. Um, so, you know, I think we need to really address that broadband issue. And I know Carol's got this in the rural context, even worse, probably. Um, one thing people forget about LA County is we have a large rural component in LA County. Everyone, it's not just Hollywood, <laughs> you know, so I, we, we face those same struggles as well. Yeah, I would agree with Steve. Um, it's not just the data collection, but it's the data analysis and then the data visualization as well. So that whole data concept is a big bucket, not just the collection of the data, got to know how to do it and then how to report it back to the public so it's understandable. But the um, broadband um, connectivity is a big issue all over the country, we know, and um, a lot of people looking at this, but it's definitely become a highlighted issue for us here in Idaho. Um, just another side story. So we had gone to a web-based, click here, sign up for an appointment. We know you're there, well, you know, and first of all, not everyone having, you know, email, not everyone having a web address at home that they can go to, and then a huge, huge um, divide in our senior citizen population, which went first in a lot of our states for the vaccine, but could not or would not navigate online appointment scheduling. Um, so a needing for us to set up back again that old world phone lines just for seniors to call and talk to a person to schedule appointments. So um, not that that's, that's part of the infrastructure side note there, but I just thought I would share that um, even though we have the, the broadband, sometimes we still have to work with the populations that don't get it. No, you know, just it's in a little different lens. I guess I always just traditionally in my, my role, and I do a lot of post handy work and flood work, uh, you know, infrastructure has been much more about the physical piece. And I think COVID has really, and a lot of emergency management does have a lot of the physical infrastructure impacts, and COVID's been this pretty invisible disaster in a lot of ways. And so um, but we know it's there and it's the social infrastructure that I think has really become much more prominent in our conversations. Um, you know, going into just right now, the, the vaccine process, um, it's how do you how do you notify in our world, you know, the elderly disabled person who speaks uh, non-English speaking on a high rise building? Um, you know, how are we getting the message to them about what they, um, where they can go and their, um, the resources available, and a lot of it is relying on that social network and that social cohesion. So um, there's quite a lot of work on our end, but how do we really strengthen the social networks um, to also have that preparedness? It's something that's always been there, but I think COVID's brought it out really immensely. I, I'm going to take this from the, if I may, sorry, Pat. Yeah, I, I think that from the complete opposite angle of all of this is, um, so I live in Northern Virginia where 70% of the world's internet traffic runs in my backyard, literally. Um, during the height of the onset of, of the pandemic, every single big name company approached us and they all dangled the, the magic black box carrot of AI. Hey, if you give me your information I will make match, I'll answer all of your questions. We'll, you know, we'll rub the lamp, the genie will pop out and you, you won't, don't, don't worry about it. We can answer all of your questions. And so we threw some of these problem sets to the biggest names and the biggest companies out there using the best infrastructure that's out there. And arguably, maybe to Steve's point, it is all about the data. You know, this, this incident, at least for us, mainly focused on the supply chain, right? You're talking about pushing gloves and masks and PPE or ventilators or the, or the drugs that go to the ventilators. And, you know, that, that supply chain network is just in time ordering it's handshake relationships between the truck drivers and the suppliers and, and that whole system ended up being broken. Right. I mean, there was, you know, we started running out of supplies 
and trying to find all of those various nodes, even though everybody was on the cloud, you got to be kidding. There's like five different major clouds and those clouds don't talk to each other intentionally. So, you know, I, you know, the opposite end of this is just as true as much as, you know, we struggle with people not having the internet, we have the best internet in the world, but yet we still can't find information or access to the data that we're looking for on the world's biggest clouds. That's my point. Thanks. That's great. <laughs> Thank you all for those for those responses. I think we're bleeding over into question two, which is what would you do differently next time? Or what do you hope to do differently next time? Um, so we're just gonna keep going in this free form format. And uh, I have a question from, from the audience. Um, are there aspects of your work, which in retrospect, this goes back to the human resources and how your, your organization works. Are there aspects of your work, which in retrospect, worked better <clears throat> under the remote working paradigm? If so, are you likely to reorganize your operations to carry on this way? I'll just throw that open to the panelists. I think 100%, you, you know, learning this remote aspect and how efficient and um, we can be in it. I, I don't see us um, being able to ever go back to what it was before. Uh, you know, I, the one thing that was really um you know beneficial was our winter storm we had a big blizzard this year at the end of january and normally when there's a winter storm we're bringing everyone into the eoc oftentimes at like to be in the middle of the night you know 2 a.m 3 a.m people having to take the subways traverse during these blizzard conditions because that's just operationally how it works or you're sheltering somewhere on a cot in the building and we got to do it all virtually and uh you know running that from my living room was a i was like wow this is Kind of great, um, you know, and I, and not having people having to go outside in hazardous conditions to work these events when you don't have to. I, I mean, I think there's a lot there. Um, so virtually, and again, obviously the um, uh, just the being able to do everything digitally and work in these collaborative online cloud-based um, systems um, and having a lot more kind of real-time information come in. I think even just how we do reporting, um, it's just you know, leaps and bounds in a different place than we were um, a year and a half ago. I'll echo everything Heather just said. Um, you know, the the taking people out of the commuting to an EOC, and not only is it just safer, it's also a huge time savings. I mean, you know, you can wake up and be at work in 30 seconds versus you know, for us and probably, you know, in some other places around the country, you know, for me, it can be an hour or two to get to our EOC from where I live, depending on traffic. Maybe with COVID, it would be less. Um, but that's all lost time that suddenly became productive. So people working these long days anyway during an emergency, at least they could work more fresh and more relaxed because they were at home. They could go take a nap in their own bed, not on a cot in a, in a EOC somewhere. So I think those are huge things that that we learned and whether we'll actually go back to the old ways after things get better or not, I think remains to be seen. Um, as I alluded to earlier, there's sort of the traditional, we always have done it that way mentality in certain parts of the hierarchy for emergency management that still wanna see people's in the room you know, or think they do. But I think the one thing we learned for sure was that the geospatial folks working on the emergency, we were the most rapidly up and running effectively remotely across the board, uh, you know, of anyone in any part of the process. Um, and I think that really showed the power of a well-oiled team working in the cloud environment. That The reason that happened is because we'd already been doing it, right? You know, GIS people have been working in the cloud and in AGOL and other other platforms for years. So it wasn't new for our GIS people. It was new for everybody else. Um, and in that sense, I think we kind of set the standard for what's possible going forward. And hopefully that'll stick. Great. Thank you. Carol, I'm going to call on you again because you do have a different perspective on this. And particularly from the from the public health viewpoint, maybe the remote working wasn't as easy for you as it was for the GIS people. So our, um, our IT GIS, I don't have a GIS person. I have one IT staff in my five counties. 
um, did work from home, was had the luxury of doing that. And I have to tell you, um, 96% of my employees worked every day from the office. Um, dealing with the pandemic like it was, dealing with um, the public. Some of the call centers happened um, offsite, but many of them, like I said, we brought back together on occasion just to do um, crisis counseling. But a lot of my staff that were integral to contact tracing, the data entry and the um, mechanism to, to make sure that we were getting the feed from all of our hospitals and our reporting labs. So those positive test results come to public health. We have to do contact tracing. We are still on a fax machine reporting system for our hospitals and labs to public health. So having um, a group of staff dealing with paper faxes coming in still during this pandemic had to be on site. And then not only did that change and then quickly by December, um, the vaccine is arriving and we, the vaccine lands at us. We are the only ones with the ultra cold freezers in our five counties. So I've had my immunization, my vaccine staff, my epi staff, they have worked on site this whole 425 days that we've been involved in this. So um, unlike, unlike lots that have been able to do remote, um, we have not found a lot of the, the technology or the infrastructure that is, has been needed to keep people at home. Um, so again, you know, writing different policies and procedures to keep employees safe and healthy, um, everyone in their, their own space, wearing masks, um, hand sanitizer, all of that. And I have to tell you, we did not have one case of COVID amongst my staff that worked the last 400 days. So um, good for them for, the, for you know, being so careful. But once vaccine started and now we're vaccinators as well, the main, the big vaccine clinics are run by my, lots of my nurses and employees. Um, we have been hands-on during this whole time. Wow. And thank you for all the work that your staff has done. And that is a great record of avoiding, avoiding infection. Very impressive. I'd like to transition us now to the last of our third questions, uh, which is what, what do we need research on now? What, what are the gaps? What are the most important gaps to be filled? What are the things we don't understand? What questions about preparedness during a pandemic would you like disaster preparedness resilient researchers to focus on? Uh, Anybody got a Heather? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, for us here, um, or for me, something I thought about is just risk communication and risk awareness. Um, I think about, um, I think we talked a little bit about. Um, coastal storm planning and evacuations and such. So in New York, um, and I used to do a lot of the hurricane planning here, um, there are behavioral studies. And so when we did our behavioral studies for evacuation compliance, um, it was right after Katrina. And so there was a large compliance rate. So we planned for all these high numbers. And I think there was a, a large awareness that urban areas could have a hurricane. Um, I don't think that was actually a very well understood thing. And Katrina brought that to light. Um, then, you know, not long after, you know, fast forward 10 years, uh, we have Irene and Sandy, and we have these two hurricanes affect us, and our compliance, um, evacuation compliance and shelter demand is lower. Um, and I think it's just, you know, a factor of people perceive their risk differently based on what's recent, what's in recent memory. And so um, COVID will be a really interesting one. And I think understanding um, people's perceived risk, and then also how we think that changes over time. I mean, what's your risk? People, I think, are going to be very um, compliant and aware today, but what do we think that might look like in one year and five years and 10 years from now? I mean, hopefully we don't have a pandemic for a long time, um, but that risk will continue and, and how do uh, people's awareness change the further out we go? I'd like to piggyback on Heather's comments because my main reaction to this question, I have two, uh, but my first one was we need to understand the social and social economic sort of components of of pandemics or disasters in general because different people do react differently 
Um, different people have different ability to communicate, receive information, ask for help. Um, so, and I, I mean, for us in LA County, I'm sure it's similar in New York City, uh, we have over 200 spoken languages in the county. Um, we do official business for many county things in 12 of those, which covers the vast majority, but still, uh, that, you know, and, and I will pick on Esri a little bit. Some of the tools let you use Google Translate, but mo uh, some of them don't. Um, and, and it only translates pieces of the stuff on the website. So building out, and we had to do this, we were, we were building out a dashboard to help people find free public Wi-Fi for, uh, to address the digital divide. We had all these kids, they couldn't turn in their homework. They couldn't get schoolwork done. People couldn't log in to find out how to get a vaccine if they didn't have internet at home. So we were putting out a website at our board's direction to publish all the free Wi-Fi around the county and people could search for nearby. Um, that was easy to do in English. And then we got asked to do it in Spanish. And that was a nightmare. Um, now, to Esri's credit, they helped us very much in working through solutions. And we got through the development of that second language. And then we stopped uh, because doing 10 more was going to be a nightmare. Um, so I think we do need ways to work on cross-cultural communication, um, whether it's in the website or otherwise, um, and, and communicating across different demographics, different languages, different abilities, you know, different age groups, all these things. Um, because there's a lot of differences in social norms and perception and understanding. So, um, and that leads to my second thought, which is, which could help this, is modeling. I think we really need to develop those kind we were good at modeling the natural events to a degree i mean we have fire models we have flood models we have all those kinds of models but i don't think we have a good legitimate modeling of how the social component interacts with those how will people actually react when the fire model says they should evacuate um, and how do we in, improve that and plan for that in advance more effectively so i think holistically i'd say modeling um, and not just the physical processes, but looking beyond the social, economic, cultural, um, and, and you know, communication modes is another big part of that modeling that was, that's missing. Well, I'll go next and so let Chris take up the lead for this one or the, the tail for this one. Um, so I, I wasn't gonna mention politics, but I'm going to because um, the pandemic ended up and still is very political. Lots of politics have gone on during this pandemic. And I, I do wonder if there's a way to capture if, if we wouldn't, if it weren't so politicized, how the uptake of vaccine would really be instead of what maybe the challenges we're having now with uptake of vaccine. Um, if it were, um, enough on politics. But the other part, um, back to Steve's issue, I think all the pandemic has shown us um, the inequities that we also have in reaching a lot of our population, um, whether they're um, different languages, ethnicities, but the, um, the inequities just in socioeconomic, this pandemic has really brought to light. And I think that that would be something else for us to, um, to maybe do more research on. The other part is, the wear and tear or the um, emotional, the mental health aspect of this pandemic, not just on public health workers, um, but this has been a huge, um, huge crisis in our public health workforce. If you look at some of the initial data out there, just that says how many local health officers have been asked to leave their jobs during the pandemic because of mask orders that were put in place in our local communities. How many were forced out because of politics? I think that the, the unintended consequences, some of this ugly stuff, Chris, that um, we would prefer to focus on the good and the, and the happy, but some of the, um, the trauma that has been inflicted on the workforce dealing with this, but also our public having to cope and understand and try to filter all of this, um, the nastiness that kind of came out of, in some people around um, the pandemic being so polarized and politicized. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to round it out, but it, you know, I, I, I wanna 
I want to pull on the string of what I heard from 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 all three of the other panelists, especially Carol, um, where where they're they're faxing information in. You know, just pause and think about that for just a second. Um, that that is reality. Uh, that's how our our county and local um, emergency managers pass information, even not in a pandemic. And so FEMA FEMA following Hurricane Irma and Maria. And one only has to think, you know, not too long and then think about Puerto Rico and, and, and the lack of power and the lack of communication and the inability to move information off the island. Uh, so FEMA came out with this concept called community lifelines. And so from a study perspective, I would, I would challenge you if you're looking for things to study, especially from a preparedness and a risk perspective, what are those, those things that somebody in a Washington DC office 3000 miles away, I, I could tell you that that is a mind boggling statement that we have hospital systems faxing information in every day. That is not what they were thinking up here in Washington DC, that, that somebody is on the ground trying to fax information in. What they were asking, I was there, they were expecting information daily and that it's all gonna be digital. And you heard Steve say, we don't even have internet. We don't have we don't have computers, and, and, and you know, moving information to make multi-billion-dollar decisions to save hundreds of thousands of lives. That's what I would encourage you to, to focus on: is what are those major major risks based on these community lifelines? That if we don't fix broadband, if we don't fix this digital divide, you're going to face this, whether or not it's a colonial pipeline or if it's a fire or whatever it is, we've got to fix these things because not everybody's equal in this great thing we call internet equality. That's really interesting, Chris. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the Community Lifelines program? Is the idea to map out in advance how different kind of communities communicate with each other? Or what's the, what's the purpose of that? Uh, sure. It, it really, it's, it's on FEMA.gov. Uh, I would encourage everybody to go to, to uh, FEMA.gov and look up community lifelines. There are seven lifelines that came out of the Harvey, Irma, and Maria season. Uh, health and safety, uh, hazardous material, power, communication, transportation, um, Food, water, and sheltering. I think I, th I think that's either six. I may have missed one in there, but um, hazardous materials is seventh. Uh, but they tried to bin major, major themes. You could think of it. Uh, UNESCO has a, a similar kind of construct. The UN has five themes. These are our seven themes. I like to think of them of, of as Maslow's hierarchy of need. You know, you, you need food, water, and shelter to get through the day. You need a car to be able to transport you from your house to the hospital. You need that hospital operating. And in order to do so, that hospital needs a fax machine and power, you know, and, and supplies to be able to get, you know, uh, to be able to respond. So there's seven general themes and then there's subcomponents under all of that. And it's a very, very fragile system. I can speak from the GIS perspective, almost none of the major seven components and especially the subcomponents, if you talk about power, Power is broken into energy and fuel. Fuel in the sense of gas stations. Is that gas station open or closed? Well, right now we use Gas Buddy. Uh, we use others as well, but there's almost very limited uh, real-time nationwide data sets for these seven lifelines. And it kind of goes back to my struggle with the supply chain. We don't think of disasters until it's too late and we're in the thick of it. What do you mean the local county doesn't have internet or, or they're passing information over a fax machine? Especially in Washington, we don't think that way. We just assume that they already have the internet or they have a smartphone or they can communicate effectively and they know what to do. So I, I think that's part of it. And, and you could take it from a resiliency preparedness standpoint to say, hey, the next time you get into this type of incident, you're not gonna have the information flow because these things are broken. You gotta fix these things first. Wow. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm happy to take additional questions from the audience. We have uh, another uh, 30 minutes or so of discussion time. Um, 
have one question on the uh, on the uh, Q and A board from one of our audience members about um, how to communicate and visualize the data. A lot of dashboards and algorithms resulted from last year's pandemic, as well as the extreme events, using different geospatial and streaming data sets. How useful have these been, or do they create confusion? So focusing on the dashboards and the information communication. Have those worked well for everybody, Heather? Yeah, uh, just to start, I mean, I, I know I've said this already, um, you know, we really moved and migrated off of just more from text to data. Um, I, I, I'm kind of blown away by what we were able to create um, and starting kind of started in PowerPoint and now we have much more robust systems, but um, there's definitely, you know, you know, data, you can tell the story you want to tell um, and there's always a way to manipulate it. And, I feel like now it's really about constantly what are we trying to say and get to and baseline. Um, I think more data science is going to be needed to be embedded in the emergency management community. I think we've had to really kind of pull from experts in our city family um, on data analytics. And um, we've, you know, we ourselves now are embedding um, a more data centric position in our, our EOC structure. So something called planning section. And now we actually have someone whose real job is just to think about data um, because there's a lots of ways to present it and, and really get to what your, you know, what your goal is. So um, this is certainly for that and I think advanced us there. Um, in terms of confusion, there's always going to be different information coming out. And, um, you know, I think it's really consistently about working across your different levels of government and partnerships. But I think, um, yeah, it, there certainly it can be confusion too. So um, that's always happening in the background. It's also trying to have that harmony of is the data the same that your other jurisdictions or levels of government are looking at too. And I think um, sharing that information is you know, creating those data partnerships is big as well. Carol, what format have you been using for communicating data outside of your office to to the public or county board members or whoever you need to communicate to and what's well, worked and what is. Our dashboards are um, have been framed around Power BI because of the simplicity of use of our staff. So that was part of the, the reason um, that platform was, was chosen. And they've been huge, hugely accepted in our areas. Some of the, um, the, the fun stuff maybe, um, you know, we post every day by, by three o'clock on our dashboard every day, new data, it's updated, you know, every day, every day. Um, the media have been some of our most rabid about the data. And as you all can imagine, um, they love it and then they hate it. And if they love to find a mistake in the data, even a comma or something that maybe isn't quite representative of what they thought, so when we first initially in COVID, our state was looking, was using a statewide data dashboard for all the counties. And it quickly became, um, they could not maintain at such. So they gave it to us at the local level to, to implement. That's where I said, we, we went from zero to 14 days with um, Power BI and our dashboards were up. So that was, um, was very helpful for us. But the switch from the state collecting the data to the locals reporting the data, the, the media had a heyday. Um, and anyway, we've, we've figured out how to use them to our best you know, abilities in reporting that data, but it has been really valuable for, um, for a lot of our population to have dashboards. They can understand them if they can get on them. And our media then extrapolates it, puts it in print because we still have newspapers. Um, and then it goes out that way to a lot of the public. I'll echo what my colleagues just said. I mean, I think dashboarding and visualization in general has been tremendously valuable, both for all the reasons that have already been mentioned, you know, communicating to the public, the media, all the other players. Um, you know, we all know the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. And the best part of that is, you know, going back to my earlier comment, it doesn't matter what language you speak in many cases. If you can visualize data without language attached to it, 
you know, and the colors and the symbols and the cartography are good, or the dashboarding, you know, icons and symbols are good, you can cross cut a lot of those language barriers um, and cultural barriers. People understand pictures much more intuitively in many cases. Doesn't eliminate the problem, but it helps. Um, I think the other thing that really we saw, um, I, I guess it's a good thing, although we're struggling with it, is our decision makers, our, our county board of supervisors, our department executives um, across the region, they fell in love with dashboards and GIS maps and all this stuff we were producing for the pandemic. Um, you know, we put, I think, about a dozen different dashboards out to the public to help find food, to help find vaccinations, you know, go down the list. Um, but now, I have to say, in the last several months, almost every new board motion specifically calls for a visualization of some sort. So it's put a lot of extra visibility on what we all do in the, the data analytics and visualization and mapping, uh, which is great. It got me the ability to hire four new people in the middle of a hiring freeze. Um, they're not, you know, so that's a good thing for from a GIS perspective, um, but it also has put a, a tremendous amount of extra workload on the teams across the county who do this stuff because they don't, you know, they suddenly went from doing a little bit to everything. Um, but we've also used that to leverage some structural change. Um, our, you know, we're big, so we're more siloed. Our GIS team now has a strong working relationship with our business intelligence team who does the Microsoft BI dashboards. They've cross-trained each other so they understand we can share data between platforms and systems and build out useful tools that in the past, before the pandemic, those were two different worlds and nobody talked to each other. Um, the other thing, and I'll, uh, Carol alluded to this with the media loving to find mistakes, I think it's actually opened us up much more to the idea of open data um, and sharing information and everyone's afraid to share data because they're afraid of getting criticized. But the flip side that I try to point out to folks is if we share data, we can make it better because people help us find gaps and errors that we can then fix. So I mean, you have to play that politic a little bit with the media or the others carefully, but there's certainly a lot more value in improving our overall understanding when we share the data out in these tools because people can see it and respond to it and help us. I'm going to jump all over that. I mean, I, where have you guys been my whole lives? I, I, it's like we're we're we're, we're best friends and, and known each other because we're in simpatico realm. So yeah, Steve, all all over that. I feel like at least over the last year, in particular, um, at least for FEMA, we kind of got into this debate of Python versus R. You know, we had the business intelligence folks and and huge numbers of people that were doing you know, Power BI or Tableau. And then on the other side of the spectrum was the GIS folks, you know, um, what we use, you know, Dawn's on, so I'm gonna pick on her and Esri just a little bit too. So we use a lot of Esri products. Um, and, and there was this, this divide, you know, is, is the GIS crowd versus kind of the data analytics uh, crowd. And, you know, we've really crossed some real good barriers there is, is and what we're saying now is, is just RSPs. We just need some really smart people, right? Uh, the GIS folks are really smart people. The data analytics are really smart people. And you get the two of them together and they get into arguments about, you know, different types of coding and that's fine, but you're going to get some really amazing analytics to come out of it. And so I think that has been a huge progress that we've seen just recently. I mean, within the last two to three months, um, maybe to go back to the original part of the question is, because of things like ArcGIS Online, and not to endorse that, I don't, I don't want to do that, but we did use ArcGIS Online as a platform. We had all 50 states mic'd up. We had nonprofits. We had over 500 applications um, around in and around the initial part of, of COVID. Yeah, there was a lot of duplication. Uh, uh, because everybody was picking up those RESTful endpoints, those RESTful APIs, and, and, and copying and pasting good practices. But it you know, it, people were to take a, take a good idea and then run with it. Uh, the other thing that really happened was they took a really good idea, used it as a baseline, and then built on top of that. And what I saw, especially with PPE tracking, and you know, they 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 really addressed some of these issues that we had with supply chain because they had a really solid baseline, and then we're able to build on top of that and scale very quickly. So, 
a lot of a lot of progress uh, both last year and then recently with this integration of better data analytics writ large. Uh, great, thank you. Our committee member Elizabeth Root has a question. Elizabeth, if you want to unmute and ask that. Sure. So um, very interesting to hear um, this discussion about visual presentation of all of this information, especially to the public. So I worked um, with the Ohio Department of Health in the EOC here for quite a while during the first six months of the pandemic. And we saw this incredible proliferation of dashboards to the tune of like, by the end of the six months, there were 200 separate dashboards representing data either internally or externally to the public. And it became actually fairly unproductive, right? It was just, you build another dashboard and then actually didn't really get used, right? Because it was just, another dashboard that was showing somebody's, frankly, pet project, right, on that, on that dashboard of data. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind commenting on, you know, how do we stop that from happening? How do we actually make that productive, right? Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna, sorry, I gotta jump on that one too. So, um, and then I really will get off and I'll shut up, but this is exciting to be a part of this panel. Um, Back in August or November, I think it was November, um, I gave a presentation to our senior leadership that, that all I really had was a, a picture of Times Square, New York City. Uh, and, and that's what was happening for us. We, we have a EOC, we call it the National Response Coordination Center. There's 55 large screen TVs in the NRCC. And each one is curated, you know, and we've got all the major news networks and, and you walk in and it's like Times Square and the dashboards were crazy. And that was the that was the presentation I gave to our senior leadership is, you know, which dashboard do you look at? Do you look at Mama Mia or do you look at Shrek? Or which which Broadway play do you want to go see today? Um, and so, A, we really need a better dashboard strategy. Uh, we need to be technology agnostic. It doesn't need to be a single branded thing. You really need to be technology agnostic. Um, and so we, and actually because of this, we have actually pivoted to create an entire analytics team and an analytics cell that, that you, there's data, the collection of data, curating data by these lifelines, putting them into dashboards with a dashboard strategy where you're actually using AI to pull out the signal and the noise, but you don't stop there. You can't just give a dashboard to a senior leader and ask them that they're now gonna have an intuitive clairvoyance based on all these 55 dashboards and know what you're trying to communicate. You need to take it one step further. And that's what we're doing with our analytics cell is, is we're not stopping at the dashboard, using the dashboards to actually feed a separate analytics group that curates that information and reduces that signal and reduces that noise and says, these are the COAs and the courses of action that you need to take based on this plethora, this compendium of information these are the things you need to pay attention to. These are the five things during this incident at this moment that you need to pay attention to. Yeah, I'll um, piggyback on that is that we, it's really about pulling out the key findings and having someone in that goes again to having people who are more data centric or data analyst experts that wasn't always part of what we fundamentally felt was embedded in emergency management because data wasn't driving and as available as what we've experienced in the last year. Um, and so I think uh, having, you know, having those folks really decipher and say, what do you need to know and take away? Um, you know, and obviously this has been a really unique situation where I think everyone's playing around and learning their capabilities. But what we're doing now is, you know, transforming how we do our reporting and starting to pre-can what new dashboards might look like. So um, again, pandemic is once in a lifetime, but now saying, okay, now that we've built this capability, how do we re-envision what our heat reporting looks like and what our winter weather and coastal storm reporting looks like. So I think taking this now is allowing us to distill back. And again, it's always about your audience at the end of the day and what they need to what they need to know. One of the things I add to the discussion, I agree with all of the above is for especially for our public facing dashboarding and visualization tools, we were very careful to, to limit the number. So we didn't have 200 of them at the end of the day. Um, I think at our peak public facing, we maybe had 10 to 12 um, and they were all very targeted. So this one's for 
how you can get food if you were, you know, a family on a school lunch program and now your kids aren't at school, where you go can do food pickups or get, you know, go down the list, vaccines, Wi-Fi, so on. But they were very targeted. But the other thing we did is we deprecated stuff. So if a dashboard was only relevant for a period of three months, at the end of three months, we made sure it went away. Um, and we had, I won't say a super formalized process, although it got better over time, but we had a process to decide through the EOC chain of command when a dashboard or a visualization or a, or, you know, a, a visualization or map or whatever it would be should be made public and what its, tar what its purpose would be. And, and then at what point, it maybe comes down because it's no longer relevant. Um, so, you know, we we tried to contain that beast a little bit so that it wasn't just anybody in any department across the county who wanted to throw a dashboard on the site um, could do that. And that for us is handled through our county, you know, PIO. Um, so that sort of controlled the messaging. And over time, it also helped us to get some standards and practices around what those dashboards and visualizations looked like. So, you know, for the public, they didn't have to learn a new interface every time they went to a dashboard for something. They were all sort of using the same templates and color schemes and branding and and low, you know, and and symbols and so on. So I think, you know, getting as Heather said, getting some norms for how you're going to do that over time. Um, it's hard in the midst of it, but we tried, um, and I think we'll all get better as we go forward. And this is Carol. I would agree with what everyone said. I think what we learned is less is more. Um, the, the fewer data points, the fewer, and keeping it consistent in the look and the feel. So like you said, Steve, people know how to navigate it easily. I think some of the confusion that we had early on, especially is people would call and say, well, the dashboard from this university or the dashboard from that national entity shows Idaho is doing this and your dashboard shows something else. So I, I, I mean, it wasn't just our local dashboards that they were having issues, that they were trying to compare us. Um, across the country to other people's dashboards. And it's been a, a learning experience, but we truly have learned that less is, is more. Great, thank you all for your input. Really lively panel, we really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I have another question from the audience that takes us more to the international realm. And uh, maybe Chris, you're probably gonna be the best one to respond to this, but the others may have something to add. Uh, one of the audience asks, regarding the infrastructure and technology issue, uh, has, has FEMA or any of you consulted with USAID? They have myriad humanitarian and disaster assistance response situations at all scales from tiny to country and even region wide, and they've developed solutions for a lot of those. Are any of those practices being looked at? Are, are we borrowing things from them? Are we sharing things with the international organizations? Um, yeah, well, yeah, to speak to USAID, you know, so Kerry Stokes is, is over there as is, is kind of my counterpart for USAID. Um, you know, we, we, we run in similar circles. Um, the last time I think we were really heavily involved in something with USAID would have been maybe the Haiti earthquake, uh, just because of the proximity of the U.S. and how close it was to Haiti. Um, actually, uh, an international, we, we do routinely deal with the international community from a geospatial perspective, and I, I, <laughs> I got to be careful about, you know, I'm not picking on anybody or endorsing anybody, but we have a, a real strong, a very strong partnership with the Copernicus Emergency Management System. Um, and we routinely activate Copernicus uh, and they do a lot of amazing things, uh, you know, all the way from a very local level, all the way up to a, a EU perspective. Uh, so absolutely. And the flip side of that is we, you, the U.S. is very geographically rich. We're very blessed. We have a lot of infrastructure. We have a lot of data. We have a lot of connections and capabilities. And so, yes, it's, a, it's, it's absolutely a top priority for our team to try to share and communicate because a flood is a flood is a flood. A flood in, you know, uh, Texas is, is, is still water in, in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. So the, the, the lessons that we've learned from all the rich data that we get, satellite, aerial, UAS, ground-based, high watermarks, the, that entire workflow can be transplanted 
over there to uh, to a, a country that may not have those same resources. And then conversely, they, they do amazing things actually on the bookends from a preparedness and a long-term recovery standpoint, especially economic monitoring through geographic technologies that I'm envious of. You know, so uh, we just had a meeting last week with Copernicus, and, and yeah, we do that a lot. Uh, we try to we try to keep uh, keep up with them, and vice versa. Absolutely. Great, thank you for that answer. <clears throat> I have another question from the audience <clears throat> that relates to um, filling the data gaps and checking data, validating data, and the question is. <clears throat> Are any of all of you using the youth mappers to assist in disaster response or any of these other organizations that organize mapathons to bring in volunteered information and uh, evaluate existing data sets? I'll just open that to. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, not familiar with youth mappers, but I'm going to find out about that after this. Uh, so thank you for that link. But yeah, here in LA County, and I know many places across the country, maybe Heather as well uh, is aware of, uh, we we worked with a, a organization and nonprofit that spun up for the pandemic. I think they're going to continue called US Digital Response. And they helped us on a a couple of big projects where we didn't have the full capacity to do them ourselves. So that's that's the same kind of an idea. They're uh, IT professionals that volunteer time and you know, to work on government projects where the capacity is lacking. Um, and that was very successful for us to partner with that outside entity. And we were able to work with them so that they understood our technology stack and data requirements. So they built stuff and then we could adjust it into our into our infrastructure, um, our hardware and software infrastructure so we could maintain these things. But that was a great way to juice the development of certain tools we needed help with quickly. Um, the other place we a little bit more peripherally worked closely with was Eurisa's GIS core, um, same thing. And they did a lot of work nationally on, you know, on vaccination sites and, and testing sites in particular, but we were, uh, I'm privileged that the, uh, the director, uh, the staff director for, uh, for that group is in Long Beach. So, and I know her personally, so I could lean on her a little bit to help us out. Um, so I think, yes, leveraging, you know, external resources was huge um, to build that extra surge capacity when we needed it. Um, and I think that's another place where maybe, you know, holistically, understanding that landscape of, of available resources. There's many others out there as well. Um, and how to coordinate those organizations um, to, to support us it would be really valuable. Yeah, so FEMA actually has a crowdsourcing unit. When we activate the NRCC, we stand up a crowdsourcing unit. Uh, that's a relatively new concept for us that actually didn't start until about Hurricane Irma. So if you think about Harvey, Irma, and Maria, uh, Harvey, the PSAPs went down, the Cajun Navy deployed, Coast Guard's trying to deal with search and rescue water missions, swift water rescue missions. And then back to back, we rolled right into Irma and we brought this up to our senior leadership. My favorite line of my entire career, they said, if not now, when? So they gave us the green light to launch a crowdsourcing unit. We've been doing it since Hurricane Irma. Um, we, we activate them routinely. We did activate uh, Eurisa's GIS core for this pandemic. And you're right, the, the pandemic, uh, the vaccine trackers, as well as all the stuff that they were doing uh, was prolific. Um, there's probably in the neighborhood of 20 or 30 digital volunteer groups that we routinely engage with. The email is fema-crowdsourcing at fema.dhs.gov just amazing people, international communities and just amazing people involved in this space, doing all thing, all kinds of things from tracking shelters to food, water and, and water bottles and, and, and you know, resources that are available. It's, it's, really, it's really an amazing thing. Heather or Carol, do you have anything to add to that? Are you using volunteer organizations in your data efforts? I don't know the answer. I should, but I don't have. <laughs> our, I, our GIS team is probably engaged, um, but I don't know about the volunteer efforts specifically to um, the geodata piece. Um, yeah, they, yeah. 
no, ahead, it's just being quite rural, we're sometimes looked at as, as the one that has the capacity um, and our capacity is very limited on this. So um, we're watching others. Yeah, um, maybe as, as Steve suggested, there'd be some way to organize that so that it, it's accessible and, and different jurisdictions don't have to build up the volunteer effort from scratch. Um, I wanna make sure we circle back to things that should be done <clears throat> when we're not in the pandemic to prepare us for the next disaster, when we're not in the next disaster. Um, <clears throat> there's one comment from the audience that's really more of a comment than a question. And uh, <clears throat> what this person says is that post-pandemic emergency response should involve mental health as well at least in many countries like mine where things are slower and less responsive than in developed countries. I don't know if you have any response to that or, or comments. I'll, I'll start that, Pat. And actually mental health has been a big component of all of our responses over the years and, and our partners with the mental health community and, and making sure that the, the public has access and we have those resources available. I think my, my comments earlier, um, we hadn't seen it affect our staff as much as we had the public in the past. So that was a new awakening for me that we are part of that public and I need to make sure that our employees are included in that mental health um, prevention, not just the recovery um, as we've gone through. And I think the, the pandemic has brought that more to light on that mental health side. But we do have great mental health partners that work with our response, our volunteers that work in our communities on normal disaster response on mental health as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, and I agree. Mental health has always been um, part of our response planning. Um, our, it's our Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is our mm -hmm. health agency's name. Um, but certainly I think COVID has brought it out as, as really, really as a focal point of um, the impact from this event. And we talk a lot about it in the COVID recovery planning and, and what might be the more long-term impact there. And so there's been quite a lot about um, doing resource navigation and part of those community networks and helping build into um, kind of the case management um, community information, um, really bolstering the, the mental health uh, services. And I'll echo, I think this event really, the prolonged nature, I think really emphasized the, um, the response workers too and their mental health. That's become um, quite a large part of the conversation about, um, you know, especially as we were planning for wave two and kind of caught our breath after wave one was really trying to um, build that into a lot of our planning um, and scheduling and staffing and services and everything. Thank you, Heather. Any other comments on that? <clears throat> um, one <clears throat> aspect that we haven't touched too much on since we've been delving so deeply into te technology is the, um, the infrastructure and the space. And before we have to wrap up in a few minutes, I wonder if anybody <clears throat> has any comments on that aspect of preparedness and disaster response, the, the non-technology, the hard infrastructure side. <clears throat> yeah, this is Carol, I, I'll just have a comment. So from the public health on the ground, we have always practiced that when public health would have a, an emergency that we needed to be involved with that SNS would raise and they would come rescue us with all of these SNS supplies that are you know, all over the world. Um, and with COVID, the way it was, and it hit so strongly everywhere, our supplies quickly were not available at all. So not technology, but gloves and masks and capes and drapes and syringes and sharps containers and needles and alcohol and hand sanitizer, all of those things that we, I guess, had, we have some, but we had the expectation that if a disaster happens that's public health related, SNS has all those supplies ready to go. I, we've learned a lot about um, what preparedness we need to actually have on the ground in order to keep ourselves at a, a place of readiness um, in, in some of those supply stocks. And we had some, but 
oh my goodness, not nearly enough. And I think Chris has mentioned as, as the supply chains, um, it, nobody could find any. And we're still, we're still in the supply chain void as it comes to needles and syringes and sharps containers and, and other things that um, we still need for a medical disaster. Yeah, and I, I think I'd just say at the, along that same line, you know, this is so different than any other disaster we're used to dealing with because everyone in the world hit, got hit at the same time. You know, when you have a fire or a flood or a hurricane, you can bring supplies in from somewhere else because they're not experiencing the same disaster at the same time. Um, so this is just something I think we never thought of or, or certainly never prepared for in, in the way that everyone has the same problem. Um, I don't know a lot about our supply chain other than uh, my department head loves to brag how he cornered the market on N95 masks. And and we had we had more masks than we could possibly need in LA County. Um, so they actually started sharing them out, you know, around the region or, you know, to other entities. But I think that's a tale of a big, well-funded, you know, massive county like LA versus a, a more rural, you know, environment like Carol's in is, you know, we had the resources and the people to go and the connections to go corner the market on certain things, which, you know, arguably is not the way we should be doing it. We should be planning more proactively and ahead of time uh, than scrambling for who's got the money and the connections to get the stuff. Um, so I think it's a lesson learned. I don't know what the solutions are. That's not GIS. <laughs> Heather, do you have any comments to add on, on infrastructure needs and maybe even physical space and things like that? Uh, yeah. Um... You know, I, I called it an invisible disaster, but there really was actually, um, you know, a, a team of people that were very focused on the physical component. Um, so our logistics uh, team, certainly on all the PPE uh, supply, but um, and um, vents and uh, um, uh, BCPs for mortality for hospital surge. Uh, we we space wise though, our actual department design design and construction. Uh, was very active in doing contracts and building out a lot of surge space for us. We had to adapt. I mean, New York City, um, you know, obviously we're you know, a very dense city that's got very, very low uh, vacancy rates normally. And in an emergency, we always say, you know, the challenge is always space. And it was interesting in this event that we space was not our issue. We had all the space, you know, hotels, as I, I mentioned in my profile, I ran the hotel program. Suddenly hotels were actually available for us to use. Um, for isolation and quarantine um, and to uh, shelter, um, shelter our healthcare workers. Um, but we were able to take these often very operational places and convert them over um, into surge space. So whether it was hospital surge, I mean, I think everyone saw Central Park became a surge space. Um, our vaccine sites right now, I think, have been really successful in converting many centers, um, uh, uh, ferry terminal buildings, and, and now we're everywhere. But when really taking these spaces and really rapidly converting them. So there's been quite a lot of adapting our built environment to serve this disaster. Great, thank you for that. Well, it's been a really lively discussion and I wanna thank all of the panelists for weighing in so actively and bringing us rich stories from their own local experience. And it was really interesting to see the differences across the scales from rural to urban and uh, from the data management side to the on the ground side. We're going to take a short break now. Um, we're going to come back at two o'clock and we'll hear two presentations from two researchers who are dealing with uh, research on disaster response during the pandemic. So thank you all for all your uh, participation and your good questions in the first session, and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Welcome back to the Geographical Sciences Committee panel on uh, preparing for multiple disasters, COVID and disasters at the same time. Um, is the screen sharing on? Can everyone see the screen with the session two? Great. Thank you, Thomas. Well, we're going to have two talks now between now until about 2.45 Eastern, 11.45 Pacific, 
from two people who are working on aspects of preparing society to deal with hazards and disasters and multiple disasters at the same time. I'm gonna first introduce Miho Mazareu. She will be our first speaker. Miho is an associate professor of architecture and urbanization at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and is director of the Urban Risk Lab, working on a large territorial scale with an interest in public spaces and the urban experience, Mazareu is known for her work in disaster resilience. In the Urban Risk Lab, multidisciplinary groups of researchers work to innovate on technologies, materials, processes, and systems to reduce risk. Operating on several scales, the lab develops methods to embed risk reduction and preparedness into the design of regions, cities, and urban spaces to increase the resilience of local communities. Prior to her work at MIT, Mazareu taught at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University and the University of Toronto. Her design work on disaster prevention has been exhibited globally. As the director of the Urban Risk Lab at MIT, Mazareu is collaborating on a number of projects with institutions and organizations in the field of disaster reconstruction and prevention and is currently working in Haiti, India, Japan, and Chile. Mazareu was formerly an associate at the Office for Metropolitan Architecture and has also worked in the offices of Shigeru Ban and Dan Kiley. Niho, are you ready to take over? We're going to move on now to our second speaker, Stephen Quiring, and he's going to give a presentation then we'll have time for a few specific questions after him, but it's followed by a general discussion with questions for all the panelists, and we're happy to get questions from the audience. And again, audience members, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Stephen Quiring is a professor in the Atmosp Atmospheric Sciences Program, Department of Geography at The Ohio State University. <clears throat> Dr. Quaring's research focuses on hydroclimatology and weather data analytics. A major focus, is, focus of his research is modeling the impact of hurricanes and other severe weather on electrical power systems. He and his collaborators have been developing models to predict weather-related power outages, damage, and outage duration since 2006. He's working with a number of utilities including Southern Company, Southern California Edison, AEP, First Energy, and Guangdong Power to support their storm impact modeling efforts. His models are being utilized operationally by these utilities to support their storm preparation and response activities. Stephen, if you're ready to go, please share your screen and go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction and for this opportunity to present on the work that we're doing. And uh, today what I'd like to talk about is specifically the compound risks that arose as a result of one particular event during um, the, the COVID pandemic, and that's uh, related to the power outages in, in Texas. And so, as was mentioned, um, my research team provides uh, weather data analytics and models to support electrical utilities and um, to do that both in terms of short term uh, pre storm preparation. So looking at things uh, a few days uh, to a few hours before an event takes place so that electrical utilities can better pre position their crews. Uh, so that they know how many assets they need to recover after storm damage and also to identify the locations in their service territory that will be hardest hit. Electrical utilities are uh, fairly proactive because if the power is off, obviously you, uh, your meter is not running and, and they're not getting paid. And of course, utility commissions um, are uh, providing oversight of electrical utilities and making sure that they are providing 
um, reliable service uh, to the customers. And so there is uh, an incentive for them to restore, uh, to uh, respond to storms in an appropriate way. Uh, on the one hand, they don't want to be too prepared uh, because that means that they have brought in more crews than they need and have paid uh, more double overtime uh, than is required. And they don't want to be caught underprepared because that's when there are very prolonged outages. So uh, weather and power outages uh, are an ongoing concern in the United States. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about overall um, context, a little bit about the specifics of the events of what happened in February of this year and what some of the impacts of that were, and then reflect on some of the lessons learned. And so when we look at Department of Energy data over um, the last couple of decades, we can see that major weather-related disruptions to the electrical power system are common. That in a typical year, we might have upwards of 140 major power outage events. And the majority of those, when we look at the number of customers interrupted, are due to weather. There's also indications that the number of these events are increasing over time, and that's both related to changes in uh, the weather and climate system. So climate change and the impacts that it's having on uh, storminess and also natural variability within the climate system when we talk about things like um, hurricanes and the hurricane season and also the aging infrastructure in the United States and the growing population um, makes uh, this a, a significant issue. These events occur, um, today we'll be talking about Texas, but these types of events can occur in all locations in the United States. And so this shows uh, from 2003 to 2017, uh, the number of events that have occurred in each state. Uh, these are the major uh, power disruptions and then how many customers have been affected. And so not surprisingly, the more populous states show up um, in a map where we're showing uh, the number of customers affected. Um, and we've also looked at this in terms of what types of weather events are really driving these major disruptions. And while hurricanes make landfall less frequently and occur less frequently than thunderstorms and winter storms, uh, when we think about the number of people affected in a given year, uh, they are uh, have a slight advantage over thunderstorms, which occur more frequently, but tend to have less significant impacts. Um, and winter storms, winter weather, which we'll be talking about now, is uh, lags considerably behind the other two categories if we're just counting the number of people that are affected. When we look at overall, um, so obviously we just sort of zoomed into thinking about uh, power disruptions, but this can be a more general um, relationship to infrastructure and to the impacts of weather as it comes to our uh, uh, society and, and economics. And so I just wanted to throw in this graphic, which shows kind of the longer term perspective when we think about um, why putting these kinds of tools in the hands of decision makers are important because these events occur frequently and have a significant um, both economic and social impact. So let's uh, zoom in and talk a little bit about the specifics of what happened in Texas and in the southern United States in February of 2021. Um, this nice summary was put together and I strongly recommend that if you want to see some of these details and read about it uh, in more detail that you visit um, the, the SKIP website. So this is one of the NOAA RESA's um, and this document is available that I've uh, culled some of this information from at southernclimate.org. Um, so the um, major cold snap that occurred and multiple rounds of snowstorms, this event uh, set nearly 3,000 temperature records in the month of February in the South Central United States. And um, these conditions, while they were most pronounced uh, around the middle of February, uh, extended for more than two weeks in some areas. And on February 16th, uh, nearly 73% of the United States was covered by snow. And the snow that fell with this system extended to places like Galveston, uh, where it is obviously quite unusual. 
So in terms of impacts, uh, early estimates from this event and the, these numbers are still being finalized, uh, estimated about $300, $300 billion in total estimated losses. And if just in the state of Texas, over 200 fatalities were associated with this event, um, both in terms of hypothermia and also um, some issues related to carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, issues related to vehicle accidents, and uh, some for whom they have, are dependent on electricity for their medical devices, and those prolonged outages then uh, caused uh, substantial harm in that way. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about these other two bullet points as I walk through. So as a climatologist by training, I can't help but show some of the unique uh, climatological aspects of this event to kind of put it into a longer term context. So first of all, this was very severe, and we can see this if we look at the number of daily temperature records, either for minimum temperatures or maximum daily temperatures that were set in Texas, in Oklahoma, in Arkansas, Louisiana, and also surrounding states. And so this map shows the locations of the stations where those monthly temperature records were um, recorded. And you can note that it wasn't just um, Texas. And even though there was a lot of press about what went on in Texas, this was a much more widespread event. We can also see the severity of it and the spatial extent if we look at this map that's shown here which is the departure in average daily maximum temperature for February of uh, 2021. And so this broad swath of the central United States uh, had temperatures that were more than 25 degrees Fahrenheit colder than normal for that day. However, this is not the only um, or the worst necessarily cold event that has occurred in uh, the observational period. We have other record setting cold events that occurred in 1899. In, in 1983, there was an, a similar event that disrupted power and water systems and resulted in an estimated 500 deaths. In 1989, the cold snap was associated with more than $1.5 billion in infrastructure damage. And more recently in 2011, Texas experienced cold conditions that also resulted in disruptions to the power system. And so it was the coldest winter weather event to occur in 30 years in many of the southern states like Texas, um, but it was not completely unprecedented in the longer term record. So what were the impacts? Um, there, as uh, most people were aware, um, substantial and prolonged power outages over much of the state of Texas. And this is uh, somewhat unique to the geography and to the power infrastructure system in Texas, since Texas has its own electricity grid that's managed by the Electric, uh, Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT. And by design, it does not cross state boundaries and is largely unconnected with the other um, power systems, the rest of the, the grid in the United States. There are some parts of the state that are not part of ERCOT. Um, so for example, El Paso and the, the, the Panhandle and some parts of East Texas, and we'll come back to that uh, in a map that I show later on. And according to um, ERCOT, the Texas grid was uh, seconds and minutes away from a complete collapse. And so as a result of this, they began uh, proactively shedding load and uh, implementing uh, power outages and rolling blackouts to protect the integrity of the grid. And this resulted in uh, millions of customers. So here a customer is a business or a um, uh, residential customer. So you have to multiply this number by three or four, depending on what the average uh, residential um, occupation density would be to get the number of people affected. So half to two thirds of the state's population experienced um, either uh, momentary or prolonged or extended power outages as a result of this. And this um, image 
here shows one example of what that kind of looked like. So why did that happen? Most of the modeling that we do focuses on uh, the impacts of storms on the power system. So high winds or ice loading, taking down power lines, taking down towers, causing vegetation to impact power systems. This on the other hand was entirely or um, primarily on the generation side. And so two factors caused uh, this. First, an increase in demand. So demand peaked at 69,000 megawatts as a result of the record cold temperatures and people uh, cranking the electric heat in their homes uh, to try and stay warm. And this exceeded uh, the worst case analysis, which was based on that 21, uh, 2011 event that I talked about. That was the previous storm of record for these cold events. Um, at the same time that demand peaked, electricity production dropped substantially, and this nice uh, graphic from the New York Times shows that. So most of the generation in Texas is based on natural gas, and we can see that um, just prior to it, a lot of the production going offline, it was at uh, a, a very high level. The vast majority of the um, production in Texas comes from natural gas. And while there were declines uh, in some of the coal fire generating plants, one of the nuclear plants went offline. Um, some of the wind turbines had to be taken offline. Uh, but most of the decline and shed load shedding was due to natural gas. Um, so basically pumps that froze, pipes that froze, and equipment that was not designed to deal with these cold um, weather issues. So as I mentioned, uh, I work with some utilities, one of which uh, serves uh, a million customers in Texas. This is what their um, outages look like. And so they have only 1 million customers, but on the 15th of February, 1.4 million customers lost power, which indicates the rolling nature of this. So individual customers lost power multiple times over the course of that day. And about 1.3 million of those 1.4 million were due to generation issues. So there were also some weather, some storm related impacts from snow, um, from high winds and those kinds of things. Um, this shows at a county level, the percentage of customers that were without power at uh, 10 a.m. on February 16th. And so you can see that much of Texas had, uh, in some cases, substantial numbers of customers without power, but not El Paso. Um, not so much the Texas Panhandle. So the places outside of ERCOT were less impacted by this event. So what were the COVID complications? Um, they, we have talked a number of times about this kind of idea of colliding disasters or compounding situations. So in this case, um, this, the electricity outages led to low water supply. Um, prolonged power outages. This caused people to do things like um, try and run their uh, barbecue inside or um, a vehicle. So then there were carbon monoxide issues. Uh, individuals who required medical treatment often were not able to receive it because those clinics closed. Um, and so this map just shows the location of electricity dependent beneficiaries uh, Texas nursing homes and also um, power outages. And so uh, unfortunately, in some of the places where there's concentrations of these, there's also uh, a lot of people who are dependent on electricity for their health. So to wrap up with some lessons learned, um, one is about uh, infrastructure resilience. Um, it is very possible to winterize and prevent cold weather from shutting down natural gas power plants. And that's successfully done in much of the United States outside of Texas and in other parts of the world. Um, after 2011, there was a recommendation to do this, but it was not enforced. And because ERCOT falls within, um, does not cross state boundaries, then it is uh, exempt from federal oversight and regulation. Similarly, there was um, some articles about how green energy was um, to blame for this, which uh, was not true, but there were some wind turbines that were taken offline because they also had not been adequately winterized um, and that technology exists and is possible. Um, the Texas grid is isolated. That makes it more vulnerable. Um, 
And there was lots of information available um, to forecast this event. This was not a surprise weather event. There was a, a long lead time. So pre-event planning um, could have helped uh, prepare for this. Also long-term preparation. They had a similar event in 2011 and that um, could have helped to inform things. Uh, most of the planning that's done, including my work with electrical utilities, is for individual events. So it does not account for um, multiple events occurring in short order or um, these events, weather-related events occurring in a pandemic or other kind of uh, major disruption to society. And we can also see that from the data I presented at the beginning that there is uh, at the same time as increasing weather events, um, increasing vulnerability to those events because of aging infrastructure and, and long-term lack of investment. And of course, as um, presenters have mentioned today and uh, Miho stressed in her presentation, this disaster had a disproportionate impact. So um, this image shows uh, the city of Austin, on the one side, we have um, locations where there is power. On the other side, we have locations where there is not power. This is a decision made by the electrical utility company, um, and perhaps for good reason, to keep a, a hospital electrified. Um, but the uh, those living in lower income neighborhoods experienced much longer uh, power outages and much more frequent power outages. And so this also has um, and an impact and is an issue that needs to be addressed when we deal with these kinds of disasters. So with that, I will stop. I think I have exceeded my allocated time. Thank you, Stephen. That was very interesting and uh, gave us a little look into a different kind of disaster that we hadn't been discussing previously. Uh, very, very interesting work. Um, I'm happy to take questions from uh, the committee or the other panelists or the audience. And maybe we'll focus a couple of questions on Stephen first and then our questions will become more general and it would be great to look at interactions and uh, across the different topics that we've heard about today. Um, so, so I have a couple of questions for you, Stephen, to get started. Um, in a power outage, so many individual households are hit and they happen geographically. There's a block or a large area that goes out. And in some of the previous talks, we've, we've heard about the concept of caring and sharing and community networks. And can you tell me whether, you know, to what extent that happened as a response in the Texas case, if you, if you have some information on this, were, were community networks of any kind, spatial community, religious community, whatever, able to help alleviate some of the impact? Um, has the power company been looking at that? Do they know how, to, how their customers responded? Uh, anything you can give us on that topic? Yeah, thank you, great question. And so anecdotally, there is lots of evidence that um, religious organizations and uh, community organizations and other uh, social networks stepped up in a huge way to provide informal support, shelter. And so this, um, there was evidence of this on Facebook through community organization, um, and especially the way the electrical power grid works, uh, because an individual circuit where I live, uh, there's two circuits. The, the circuit that I'm on across is different than the one across the street. So there are situations where um, my neighbors may have electricity and I do not. And that also happened in the Texas case. And so that was one way where people were able to um, come together. But of course, uh, that is also a challenge in the midst of COVID where there were um, restrictions or, or precautions around um, getting people together in the same house who are uh, not related. So it, it did happen. I, I would say the electrical utility that I'm working with uh, is not directly, has not directly looked at 
kind of what, what happened from a, a social standpoint. They have mostly focused on their um, response to uh, sort of the, their crews, how quickly they were able to respond, thinking about where and when they should, um, how they should prioritize different circuits in terms of turning the power back on. Great, thank you. Yeah, I guess I'm not surprised at that answer, but I wanted to ask. Uh, Budu has a question. He has his hand raised. Would you unmute yourself, Budu, and, and ask the question? Okay, I, I don't have those controls. So somebody is making this magic happen. So that's where a little bit of a delay is coming from. So I appreciate your patience. Um, Stephen, that was a fantastic presentation, and and I'll I'll connect up with you separately because I lead the DOE's effort for which is a capability called Eagle Eye, uh, which monitors um, these outages in real time. And so I have a question that connects what you just described versus what Miho just talked about, right? So how can we change the design of these areas where? Um, sort of green technologies or solar panels that add resiliency to your power. Uh, we saw Ford F-150s powering homes and, and you know, medical supplies. Um, are you actively, do you think that the utilities are thinking about those that, you know, just so they are not solely looked upon the bad people creating this kind of a challenge um, that they should encourage? You know, there is an economic conflict, right? if everybody generates their own electricity, it will create a challenge for the utilities particularly. So do you think that there, we could you know, push a faster penetration of those green technologies, energy technologies to mitigate as part of the urban design? Yeah, there are lots of useful solutions and mitigation and preparation and infrastructure hardening. So microgrids, distributed generation, the um, behind the meter solar panels and, and other kinds of uh, green technologies that can be used at the household or business level for generating and uh, batteries for storing uh, electricity at your own residence. Obviously, those, again, who had the ability to run a generator or who had a generator were able to um, prevent uh, some of the, the, the hardship from occurring. So there are lots of solutions that exist. Um, I, I think there are at, in different states and different utilities programs to kind of incentivize and encourage those. Uh, obviously, uh, Texas at, at, a, at an ERCOT level, um, knew what it could have done after 2011. And there are some, yeah, political repercussions that will be felt from uh, not having prepared. Thank you, thank you. Okay, not seeing any more questions from the panel right now. Um, another thought that occurred to me is how different is the response to a heat wave versus a cold wave? Um, in a heat wave, we also have increased demand. And um, does that have a different spatial pattern or a different kind of response than a cold wave? Yeah, great question. Um, for the, the modeling that we do, there, there absolutely are different impacts depending on the types of weather events that occur. And from a disaster preparation and response standpoint, um, there, there are some commonalities that in terms of how you might respond. So in both extreme cold and extreme heat, there's an increase in demand. And at the same time, there uh, can be a, a reduction in generation in both of those cases. And typically the response has been to have things like centralized cooling centers where um, people who, who don't have power or 
are unable to afford air conditioning or don't have the means to go somewhere can come to a community center or centralized location. And, and same thing happens during extreme cold events that uh, many municipalities will open up shelters so that people can get out of the cold and have a place to warm up. And that has worked in the past. Um, and, and that works if you treat each disaster individually. But one of the challenging and fascinating components of the last year has been because of this compound cascading nature of things, um, the, the past solutions that, that worked, and Miho referred to this in her presentation, and which is that the way that some of these things are designed may not work well in a pandemic and, and may not be suitable, whether it's, it's heat or cold or a hurricane, occurring um, that's going to cause issues. And, and sometimes we want to move people out of the way or move people to a safe location. But where is that safe location now? And what does that, how do we need to design and implement that? Yeah, good point. Um, it definitely does bring back the issue of design of public spaces that Miho addressed, designing them as cooling centers, designing them as warming centers, designing them as shelters, designing them for people to be able to shelter in a dispersed way. Um, I don't know if Miho has anything to weigh in on that, but uh, what about some of these chronic disasters versus more drawn out disasters and the compounding effect of maybe hurricane evacuation at the same time there are power outages and how do those things interact in the design of spaces? Can we solve it through schools or do we really need to think of other kinds of spaces? Um, I wonder if Carol Morley is still on from a rural perspective, um, what does her community do for shelters? What are you planning to do for the coming year? And uh, it's going to be a much different context from the urban areas. Thank you. And um, just like Miho said, um, we have typically our shelters have been in our school gymnasiums, or perhaps our um, we have a couple little strip malls that have been converted into mass shelters. But with COVID, that wasn't um, the case at all. We found more with COVID, if we use our um, forest service as an example, we sheltered and isolated them in hotel rooms that were individual. Um, again, air systems that circulate, use of common uses of bathrooms and things like that, when we're looking at a disease entity, doesn't work for shared spaces like we do if it's outdoor air quality from the, the smoke and the fires. We are assessing that right now for future as well to see how we can make this a, a broader shelter issue for um, a varied degree of um, disasters, not just for our outdoor air quality is what we had typically um, had our shelters for in the past. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Anybody else would like to weigh in on that issue? I have another topic I just like to kind of throw out to the panelists in general, all of you who are who are still here, and it's from my experience in my own community, and that is the homeless population. We have a big homeless population in Eugene, a big one in Portland, a lot of West Coast cities have that problem, perhaps more than some of the Eastern cities. Um, serving the homeless touches on almost all of the problem areas that people have brought up today. Um, shelter, health, information. How do we get information about the homeless so we can serve them better? And I wonder if any of the panelists or speakers have any experience from their work on new solutions that have emerged for addressing uh, support for homeless people during disasters and the pandemic. Just open it up to any speaker who wants to comment. 
I'll attempt to jump in on this. It's a complex problem for us in LA County, obviously. I, I hear different numbers on how many homeless we have. Um, of course, a big problem is just getting a handle on where, how many there are, where they are, what their patterns of movement are through different times of year, because there are migrations, so to speak, um, based on weather and other things. Uh, I think this goes to some of the things Mio addressed and some of the things I brought up about, you know, just how we communicate with populations. I mean, whether they're housed or unhoused, I think it doesn't really matter at some level. There's social, cultural, language, you know, socioeconomic and so on limitations. Um, and I think one of the problems we and many others probably have with the homeless population in particular is one, we don't really know where they are. Um, I mean, the, 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 I guess the, you know, the keystone data set on homeless populations is usually the point in time count. It's done once a year in January, and then we pretend like we know everything about our population. Um, and if I have a pandemic that hits in March or April, and I'm trying to go out and do outreach, the January data doesn't help me because people have moved. Now, there are certain places there we expect and know we'll see people. Um, and I think the, the hardest part of that is the less visible part, because again, you know, we don't, we see people camped out along the sidewalks or under the bridges and things like that, but we don't see the ones that are more hidden. Um, and I think the, the related piece in context of pandemic is tracking people once they're entering the system. And it's not unique to the pandemic, but once you start doing outreach and providing services to somebody who's unhoused, it's hard to follow them through the system. It's hard to know where did they go and what help did they get? And then do they fall off the radar? And obviously we can't put GPS tracking devices on, on individuals and follow them around, but we can't even get our hands around how to give people some kind of a common identifier in our computer databases so that we can know that somebody showing up in one part of the county this week is the same person in another part of the county next week. So I think there's a lot around, again, the communication outreach and also understanding that population, which is very different than the house population who for the most part are where we expect them to be when we wanna reach out to them and their communities. Miho, you look like you have something to add on that. Do you have a question? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question or comment? Uh, yes. And uh, there's my video. Uh, the the homeless uh, issue, indeed, so complex. And I, and I wonder, uh, given the pandemic, I live in the Inland Empire, which is uh, east of uh, Los Angeles County. And um, I'm sure Steve can speak to this as well in Los Angeles County because uh, we're hearing so much about people who are becoming homeless. They have never been homeless before, but because of the economic pressures of the pandemic, they are now moving or forced to move into, into that category. And I'm at a loss to to know how we are able to to track them as well and to and as Steve mentioned taking a, a homeless census in January and then thinking that we we have um, we have the full picture is uh, is so so unsatisfactory so so daunting uh, so I, I just wanted to to bring that out also in, in case anyone uh, on the the panels uh, is working in, in that area. And then uh, also, it just seems to me to be uh, the specter of environmental racism is, is throughout all of this, especially with Stephen's example of one half of, of Austin in that picture that he showed having power and the other half just right next door uh, not having power for days, different socioeconomic, uh, ethnic uh, part of that city, uh, th th that specter continues. And uh, from my standpoint as a mapper, that, that type of uh, justice, injustice mapping needs to continue as well. Thank you. Great comment, so, Don. Thank you. Go ahead, since Steve. You well, since you name checked me, I have to <laughs> maybe try and weigh it. Um, I, I think, Don, you bring up, you know, some good points. I mean, it, and obviously, you know, we do have a huge number of people who have moved out of 
you know, stable housing into unstable situations in the pandemic. And again, it's been disproportionate based on the kinds of work and, and you know, opportunities different communities have. Um, I don't think we have good mechanisms for tracking that other than knowing, you know, obviously a lot of parts of the country, LA County included, we put, you know, eviction moratoriums and rental relief and all these other things, but those things are going to go away at some point. Um, so I think we, you know, we have governmental systems that capture information about people getting housing vouchers or other services that give us some sense. But again, it's, it's, we don't have systems and, you know, that track these things through time and space in a meaningful way. And I think that's, that's the tough part. Um, one other thing I'll throw out, I, it's my insane idea about doing something better than a point in time count. I think there's an opportunity to actually use remote sensing to count, you know, non-traditional shelters, tents, whatever they may be, more frequently by doing image classifications. We're not going to get them all by any stretch, but I definitely could see the tents on the sidewalks from the air. I, I probably could see tents under the canopy in a park or hidden behind a, a wall or places that I don't see. Point in time counts just drive down the street. So if you're not visible from the street, you don't get counted at all. And that may give us a way to, you know, I think we need to be creative about moving away from field data collection all the time to field validation of remote collection methodologies or you know other estimators so that's my my insane idea for the researchers who do remote sensing is we need to find ways to do that great that's a really neat idea <laughs> i was just about to say remote sensing won't work for the homeless but maybe you've got some ideas it, we should try it it should be tested any other questions or comments from the panelists on homeless or any of the other issues we've touched on? Well, if not, I wanna thank all the panelists, the four panelists this morning, Carol Morley, Steve Steinberg, Chris Vaughn, and Heather Reuter, and our two speakers this afternoon, Steve Quiring and Miho Mazareu. Very fascinating work from all of you and very active discussion. We really appreciate the active discussion. And this has provided a lot of food for thought for the geographical sciences community. And I hope for our audience who is listening today and our audience who will be able to view it later on online. So a big round of applause <clears throat> for all of our speakers. Thank you very much. And I think we'll wrap up now. <laughs>